Strong Pokemon, weak Pokemon. That is only the dumb perception of people. Truly skilled trainers know that their favorites are being screwed over by the system. We can all identify whether a Pokemon is good or bad looking at its stats, typing, and abilities. But something that isn't quite as surface level is how poorly these Pokemon get treated by the devs themselves. You may think a Pokemon looks fine at a glance, but these select few have been screwed six ways from Sunday by their own creators. Either rendering them completely useless for a playthrough or restricting their full potential in some format or another. These are the most unfortunate Pokemon ever made. When I think of unfortunate Pokemon, it's hard for Sneasel to not immediately come to mind for Gen 2. Of course, Gen 2 is notorious for mistreating many of its most iconic Pokemon. Just go ask Houndour how it feels about its many Johto locations. And Sneasel is no exception. In Gold and Silver, as well as their remakes, Sneasel can only be found at Mount Silver, the literal last area of the game. Thankfully, Crystal moves Sneasel to a more suitable home, the Ice Path. Actually, I'm not too sure if that was a good thing, because you really shouldn't be tempted to use this cursed Pokemon in Gen 2. As you should know, prior to Gen 4, moves were categorized as physical or special, depending on the type itself, rather than the individual moves. With Dark and Ice both being labeled as special moves, this rendered Sneasel's stab options completely useless with its pitiful base 35 special attack. In fact, the only physical move it can learn by leveling up in Gen 2 is the base 50 power Metal Claw at level 65! Also, it learns Surf for some reason, and I don't know why, but I just thought that was funny. Even if you turn to TM, Sneasel's best options are Shadow Ball, Return, and the highly unreliable Dynamic Punch in Iron Tail. Needless to say, Sneasel did eventually receive its huge buffs in Gen 4, not only with the physical special splits, but also gaining Weavile as an evolution. Not that it really matters in the Johto games, because as I mentioned earlier, Heart Gold and Soul Silver took Sneasel back out of Johto for god knows what reason. And as I detailed in an earlier video about rare occurrences in Pokemon, Sneasel also notably has the rarest evolution item in all of Alola, only being found on 5% of Wild Jangmoo. And oh hey, another JPR video reference, who remembers this guy, Chien Pao? You know, the Pokemon who basically made Weavile obsolete this generation? I guess it wasn't enough that they took Knock Off and Triple Axel away. So even in this Pokemon's post-buff era, Game Freak has still found new ways to screw it over. Also representing Gen 2, we have Hitmontop. Now, like Sneasel, Hitmontop did eventually turn into a decent Pokemon as time went on. But in Gen 2, it's hard to find anything redeeming about this Pokemon. It's hard just to get this Pokemon in general. In any Johto game that isn't Crystal, it's only obtainable in Mount Mortar after you've gotten Waterfall. So it's gonna be level 10 while your whole team is pushing into their 40s. And of course, Hitmontop evolves from Tyrogue at level 20, but only if Tyrogue's attack and defense stats are the same. For a Pokemon with base 35 in every single stat, this wouldn't seem like a hard task. But of course, this is Pokemon, so you have to consider IVs, EVs, DVs, RVs, DMVs. So much goes into calculating a single stat that it's actually remarkably hard to balance the two. And in Gen 2, your reward for pulling off this feat is a sweaty pile of garbage. First of all, Hitmontop only learns one true offensive fighting move by leveling up, and that's its signature move, Triple Kick, at level 49?! Oh cool, you get to kick Lance's Dragonite in the face for 6 damage, yippee! Did I mention that Triple Kick is probably one of the worst signature moves ever made, even by Gen 2 standards? Don't even think of touching those TMs, Buster, because they ain't much better. Well, what about its other signature move, Rolling Kick? It clearly says right here that it learns it at level 1. And while that's true, well, you can't get a Hitmontop before level 20, and since there isn't any move reminder present in Gen 2, you actually have to transfer your Hitmontop to Pokemon Stadium 2 for it to relearn its best attack. Oh, does that sound bad? Don't worry, because I'm not done yet. Because you actually have to beat the entire Elite Four and Champion in one sitting without pausing the game, yes, Stadium actually keeps track of this, and Hitmontop has to be in your party for you to even have the option to relearn a move. So essentially, you're carrying dead weight with you for five really tough battles. Good luck! If you even have access to a physical copy of Stadium 2, which I sure don't. This has to be one of the most ridiculous features of all time, and I'm shocked more people don't talk about it. Because it's the only way multiple Gen 2 Pokemon have access to some moves. TLDR, treat Hitmontop like a disease if you're replaying those games, and stay away! 
If you've ever felt forgotten, then don't worry, because you have something in common with a few evolutions from the early Pokémon remakes. We'll start with Espeon and Umbreon in Gen 3. Unlike the previous Pokémon we've discussed, there was nothing wrong with these Pokémon from a usability aspect. Well, aside from the fact that you can't use them. That's right, since Fire Red and Leaf Green contain no day-night cycle or a clock to keep time like the Hoenn games do, Espeon and Umbreon can't be evolved from Eevee under any circumstances in these games. The only way to get them into your national decks is to either trade Eevee to Ruby, Sapphire, or Emerald, evolve it there and trade it back, or transfer them in already evolved from Colosseum or XD on the GameCube. This is an incredibly rare instance of a Pokémon's evolution method being completely forgotten about in a game, but they aren't the only ones. Leafeon and Glaceon share this exact same problem in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Due to the absence of the Moss Rock and Ice Rock, Eevee is unable to evolve into either of these Pokémon, and as such must be traded to a Sinnoh region game to evolve there instead. But they aren't alone, as Nosepass and Mangaton's evolutions are also inaccessible in these remakes despite the existence of the Kanto Power Plant. Location-based evolutions also proved to be a massive issue in Pokémon Sun and Moon, as Chargebug and Crabrawler, two very early game Pokémon, weren't able to evolve until the final stint of the game when you should be in the high 50s. Fortunately, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon managed to somewhat circumvent this by allowing earlier access to these special areas. But this is likely why starting in Generation 8, all location-based evolution methods have been retired, being replaced by stones instead. Nonetheless, all of these Pokémon that relied on locations to evolve all found themselves getting the short end of the stick at some point or another. Fun fact, by the way, Nosepass's evolution method wasn't updated in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl since it was absent in Sword and Shield. So it still has to go to Mount Coronet to evolve, while Magneton can simply use a Thunderstone. This would later be corrected in Legends Arceus, but serves as another lol BDSP moment. But there's only one thing unluckier than most of these Pokémon, and that's the person watching this video who isn't subscribed. I mean, who wouldn't want more great videos to help increase their knowledge about Pokémon for free? We're only 5k away from 200,000, so if you're not subbed yet, I would really appreciate it. Now, there are tons of Pokémon over time who have been stuck with only a handful of moves. Magikarp, Krikatot, Tynemo, Applin... But one who feels truly cursed more than all the others would probably be Beldum. In Ruby and Sapphire, Beldum's debut games, you can only obtain it from Steven's house after entering the Hall of Fame, and this Beldum is set at level 5. Now, fortunately for Beldum, unlike other pre-evolved pseudo-legendaries, it evolves relatively fast, evolving into Matanga level 20 and then Metagross at 45. Though, in the games of Ruby and Sapphire, I have to ask, what's even the point? Because if you've played those games, you would know there's hardly any post-game material at all. It's basically just the endless battle tower which doesn't even award EXP, so you're stuck exclusively grinding rematches in order to even get Metagross. Even in future generations, Beldum's luck isn't much better. It's pretty much a post-game exclusive Pokémon in every region except the Alola games where you can find it close to level 30 on Mount Hokulani, meaning you can pretty much evolve it into Matang right away and not suffer through the hell of using Takedown over and over and over again. And in Gen 8, although Beldum is found at level 60 in the Crown Tundra, pretty much taking care of all the tedious grinding for you, its lone move Takedown has been replaced with Tackle. So, Beldum's future as an early game Pokémon looks even bleaker now. I suppose in the grand scheme of this video, Beldum is far from the most unlucky Pokémon in the world. I mean, it does evolve into Metagross eventually, but it does seem to be remarkably less lucky than any other base form of a pseudo-legendary. Thanks to its absurdly small move pool and just generally being a very inaccessible Pokémon in most titles. But when it comes to the region of Hoenn, I can think of one unluckier Pokémon who doesn't evolve. Survivor. Well, unless you listen to Ash Ketchum. Trainers, which one of these Pokémon evolves into Survivor? Okay, Trainers, if you chose Arbok, you were right! Chalk. Survivor is meant to be a counterpart to Zangoose, being bitter rivals, version exclusives in Hoenn, and having the same base stat totals. But it's clear to see that in this rivalry, Survivor drew the short straw. Its stats are distributed far worse, having the unholy combination of being slow and frail, while Zangoose at least gets some usage as a glass cannon. But perhaps more importantly, Zangoose belongs to the erratic EXP group, meaning it requires the least possible experience to reach level 100, being 600,000 EXP. 
Sviper, meanwhile, is in the EXP group that takes the longest to reach level 100, requiring 1 million more EXP than a Pokémon in Zangoose's group would. Fun fact, almost every Pokémon in this incredibly unfortunate EXP group is from the Hoenn region except for the Drifloon family. But among them all, Sviper is certainly the worst. And that's saying a lot, because Illumise is also in that group, but at least that Pokémon has a decent ability and some okay moves. And talking just in terms of a main story playthrough, Sviper offers next to zero utility for Hoenn. The two types that Poison beats, Grass and Fairy, are incredibly scarce in Hoenn, especially in Gen 3 where fairies don't exist yet. And it has zero favorable matchups against any gym leaders, evil team leaders, or Elite Four members after the point where you'd normally catch it. Sviper can call its relationship with Zangoose a rivalry all at once, but in all reality, it's basically a one-sided curb stopping. Now, skipping to the Unova region for a moment, our next pick is a Pokémon who is actually quite good, but could have been leagues better. One of Unova's most popular, Zarowark. Zarowark is well known for its illusion ability, allowing it to disguise itself as the last Pokémon in your party. When this was first revealed, it was almost universally agreed upon that Zoroark was going to be more broken than pre-patch BDSP. Surely, this should have been one of the best competitive Pokémon introduced in Gen 5. But there was one snag that no one could have foreseen. The addition of the Team Preview feature, allowing your opponent to see all six Pokémon you would be using in a match. This severely undercut Zoroark's surprise factor as people now knew to expect it at any time. Now, as I just mentioned, Zoroark is still an above-average Pokémon, and Illusion is still a really good tool that can catch opponents off guard, but imagine if Zoroark had been introduced in Gen 4 when Team Preview didn't exist. I think we may have seen a completely different beast. But competitive landscape aside, Zoroark is still pretty unlucky in its debut games in Black and White, now being completely unobtainable in those games without trading or having access to the incredibly scarce Crown City Beast Trio. Even if you do have these rare event Pokémon, Zorua and Zoroark is still post-game only catches, since you need to unlock Poké Transfer to get the event Celebi and Beast Trio that activate their respective events. Zoroark isn't the only unlucky Gen 5 Pokémon though, as that Gen was notorious for introducing many Pokémon with incredibly late evolutions. Some of these, like Hydreigon, can be justified even today, but some of the others are now stuck with this horrible curse. Rufflet, Vullaby, Ponyard, and Larvesta certainly come to mind. All of these Pokémon are way too weak to use reliably in the late game, and none of them evolve before level 50. Larvesta in Black and White is a particularly rough case. If you want to use Volcarona before the postgame, then you're going to have to get it all the way to level 59 from hatching it at level 1. Black 2 and White 2 would thankfully throw all of these guys a bone, well, except you Bisharp, you still have to wait, as you can at least catch their fully evolved forms decently early in the story. But outside of Unova, they aren't as lucky. The next games Rufflet and Vullaby would be attainable in were Sun and Moon, where they had to be caught around level 10 on Route 3 and raised all the way to level 54. In most scenarios for these Pokémon, you usually have to do about 20 levels of training with a Pokémon that's not very good by that point. Sure, mandatory EXP share helps, but nobody likes a leech. These Pokémon were already at a disadvantage in the Unova region, but in most regions that come after, their high-level requirements seem to be becoming more and more of an issue. When it comes to modern-day Pokémon, though, I can't think of anyone truly more unfortunate than Golisopod. Golisopod has all the tools to be a truly amazing Pokémon. Incredible stats, a diverse move pool, and access to great priority moves, including First Impression. The one thing holding it back? Its signature ability, Emergency Exit. Basically giving your opponent control of when you switch out. And as a slow Pokémon with not amazing special defense and quite a few common weaknesses, it's not hard to get it down to that dreaded 50% HP mark. This also forces Golisopod to run heavy-duty boots to avoid excessive damage from Stealth Rocks, which are an absolute killer for this bug type, meaning it has to sacrifice an item that would give it better damage output like Life Orb. But that's all competitive mumbo-jumbo. What about the main story? Well, it doesn't look much brighter there. Wimpod is an extremely hard Pokémon to race without EXP share due to its horrid stats and shallow level-up move pool. And while Golisopod in the main story is perfectly usable, even good, I dare say, its ability still makes it feel like an annoyance than an actual tool to take advantage of. He's a great Pokémon whose potential is held back by one mediocre gimmick. But that'll do it for today's video. Before I go, I'd like to thank everyone who came out to our last live stream and became a channel member. Remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time.